Uh, Shinran Shonin uh, was born 1173 during a very tumultuous Kamakura period. And at the age of nine, it said uh, he lost his parents uh, due to various circumstances. And uh, at the uh, age of nine, he became a Tendai monk. And for 20 years, he studied on Mount Hiei. And at the age of 29, it said that uh, Shinnan left Mount Hiei. And he left because of his great honesty. Here is Shinnan trying so hard to attain enlightenment. And after 20 years of arduous practice, still he found himself incapable. And instead, within, he found, when he looked within, Shinnan found always huh, the three poisons. And I explained the three poisons to the kids as a gas, easy to remember. Greed, anger. And I don't like the word stupidity, but it, it fits gas. <laughs> so <laughs> stupidity. Uh, the word is really ignorance, huh? I think it's a better word. Ignorance. See? And Shinnan looked within and saw no matter how hard he was trying, still he found within him moments he's feeling greedy, gets angry, and ignorant. Huh? But see, within this word ignorance, what do you see? The word ignore. Huh? Ignore. There's the word ignore in ignorance. Ignorance means you're ignoring something. You're not looking at something. So Buddhist stupidity is not one plus one is three. That's mathematical ignorance. Huh? Buddhist ignorance is when we ignore what? When we ignore, get it? When we ignore impermanence and interdependence. When we refuse to acknowledge that. When we repent, when we start to think, I'm going to live forever. I can take things for granted. Huh? Then we're ignorant. That's Buddhist ignorance. So Shinnan looked within and found still, no matter how hard he tried, still, he said, filled with greed and anger and ignorance, forgetting the truth of impermanence, interdependence. And so he left Mount Hiei, and he found a great teacher in Honen Shoni. And Honen introduced Shinnan to the Nembutsu path. And uh, it said that Honen uh, teaching the Nembutsu sharing it with people. And up, up until the time of Honen and Shinnan, uh, Buddhism in Japan was very much the property of the rich and famous. Huh? Uh, it was accessible only to nobility and those with means. And temples, uh, the, the altar area was huge. And the gejing area where the people would sit was very small. So, you know, the hondo that you have here, beautiful hondo here in Vancouver, if you imagine it in reverse, where the, all the pews are would be the altar, and where the altar is, that's where people could sit. Huh? So they had many monks and, and huge altar, and only a few places where people could sit, because it's only the, the, those with means and influence would be coming to the temple. So it was the property of the rich and famous. And with Shinnan and Honen, they were sharing the Nembutsu with everyone. And it started to grow, become more and more popular, which incurred much jealousy. And uh, in time, um, Nembutsu practice was outlawed. It was made illegal to recite Namu Amida Butsu in public. Huh? To do so, you could be executed. And some disciples worked were beheaded for reciting Nembutsu. Interesting, huh? Wow, there was such a time. So at that time, Shinnan uh, and Honen were exiled. Uh, Shinnan went to Echigo up north, and Honen to Shikoku, the island uh, off of Hiroshima. And um, they never saw each other again. But in a way, 
this became a great opportunity for Shinran to share the Dharma in a new place. Huh? And very much found himself a bil- to, to say, I am neither a priest nor a layman. To have no attachment, no attachment to anything except wanting to share the Dharma. So Shinran began to share the Dharma, share the Nembutsu, and uh, he became very well known, huh? very charismatic, clearly. And after he passed away, uh, people began to make pilgrimages to his uh, gravesite. And there was no doubt that uh, uh, Shinran impacted on many, many people in his lifetime. And after he passed away, his wife and daughter, uh, they formed the Honganji. Uh, they started Honganji. Shinran didn't intend to create Jodo Shinshu. I think that's interesting to note. Shinran lived his entire life and died as a disciple of Honen. He never for a moment said, I am going to found a new religion. It will be called Jodo Shinshu. No, 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 no. He was a disciple of Honen, sharing the Nembutsu teaching. So, uh, but uh, Shinran especially tried to... Uh, ne- ne- the Nembutsu teaching was one of many ways that Honen taught the Dharma. And it's one that Shinran especially gravitated to. And he felt, this is for me. This is for me. Shinran never said, Nembutsu is the way for everyone. He said, this is the way for me. Uh, this is the way for This is the best way for me to understand the Dharma, to practice the Dharma, to appreciate the Dharma. And so this Nembutsu teaching really caught on. And what is it? Uh, Jodo Shinshu is Nembutsu teaching. Namu Amida Butsu is Nembutsu. Jodo Shinshu is this sect of Buddhism Namo Amida Butsu is the essential teaching, the heart of Jodo Shinshu. So what is it? Uh, what is it we're saying when we say Namo Amida Butsu? Uh, so I think that's what I want to spend a little time on before I open it up for some questions. I want us to be able to understand what is this expression that we say, Namo Amida Butsu. Okay, and this, as I think is written, namo huh, can, can be described or uh, translated as to think upon, to center our lives on, to be focused on. So, so to think upon, huh, I'll just use that one, think upon, center our lives on, and Butsu is Buddha, which we know is one who is awake. Huh? And then Amida. Wow, what is Amida? Amida is very, very interesting. Amida is a concept um, that embodies the essence of Shakyamuni Buddha's enlightenment. What is the essence of Shakyamuni Buddha's enlightenment? Huh. Um, after a hun- few hundred years, there was a, uh, after the Buddha died, councils of monks would meet, and they would debate, no, you have to follow what Shakyamuni taught, the words that he taught. And then sometimes we get bogged down in just arguing about words. Then there was a group and the Mahayanas, the Mahayana Buddhists, they said, no, no, we should be more concerned with the content of his enlightenment, content of his life. What was the essence of Siddhartha's enlightenment? What was the essence of his awakening? That's the goal of Buddhism. Uh, in a way, uh, there's a great the haiku poet, Basho, that some of you know. Uh, Basho, I love this saying by Basho. He said, do not follow in the steps of the masters. Seek instead what they sought. Huh? Get it? 
to not follow in the steps of the masters. Instead, look for what they were looking for. Seek what they sought. Huh. Wow, it's powerful. And in a way, I think this captures the Mahayanist view. Don't just march and step following the words only. Huh. Think about the essence, the dynamic living essence that was Siddhartha's enlightenment. Seek what he sought. And so they distilled the essence of his enlightenment to these two concepts. And you see them there, Amitayus and Amitabha. I think I wrote that down. Amitayus, Amitabha. And what is this? Huh? And these two, Amitabha. These two things are wisdom and compassion. Huh? Wisdom and compassion. So the essence of Shakyamuni Buddha's enlightenment was wisdom and Amitayus. Amitayus, Amitayus is not just wisdom, it's infinite, infinite wisdom. And Amitabha is not just compassion, it's immeasurable compassion. Immeasurable compassion. So, Namo Amida Buts means to think deeply upon the infinite wisdom and the immeasurable compassion, awakening that surrounds us and sustains our lives. Infinite and immeasurable. But, you know, I don't really care for these words, wisdom and compassion. Um, and wisdom, <laughs> wisdom with the M. I don't care for these words. Uh, I don't use them very often in sacramental. Uh, I, I use instead, instead of wisdom, because these words are wonderful words, but they're so great. They're so great, they're almost, well, they are unapproachable. If I said to you, are you capable of wisdom? Huh. You might feel like, well, hey, wisdom, I don't know. I mean, you know, do I look like a Buddha? You know? <laughs> no, but if I said, are you capable of understanding? Huh. You would feel, I think, yeah, I can understand. So I use instead infinite understanding. So we can start to get a feel for it and, and not think it only happens out there, but it happens right here inside of me. And instead of compassion, you know, are you capable of true compassion? I don't know about that. But are you able to care? Huh? Are you able to care? Sure, I can care. So use caring. C A R I N. Caring, immeasurable caring. So to think about the immeasurable understand, infinite understanding and immeasurable caring that surrounds and sustains us, that allows us to live. Huh. And you need both. You need wisdom and compassion. You need caring and understanding. One is not better than the other. Wisdom is not better than compassion. And compassion is not better than wisdom. Although often we tend to judge, no, no, you need compassion, that's more important. No, no, wisdom is more important. No, caring and understanding are both essential. If all you have is one, you have nothing. You need both. Huh. If you only have one, it's not enough. And if it's lopsided, it's no good. Huh. Like having your wheels aligned in the car for it to go straight, huh. they have to be balanced have to be balanced, wisdom and compassion together. 